the theme of Blue Hat Strike, Strike Blue Hat this year is community. And it's the community that exists with our external researchers, but also the community inside of Microsoft. And that's what I love. We collaborate with each other. And part of that community is our next speaker, who is James Forshaw from Google. And he is wonderful at finding problems in our products. Uh, and he's here today to talk about why he builds his own security tools and why you should too. Now, for those of you that are familiar with James from Twitter, I brought something to help you identify him. So with no further ado, <laughs> James Forshaw. Why, thank you. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, just in case you don't know who I am. Um, OK. Oh, all right. So uh, yes, uh, I'm here to talk about tooling, sort of tools are the defining characteristic of humans, right? We build tools, and therefore we are human. And the security research, um, if you're a security researcher, that's no, no different. And of course, if you're a developer, it's no different. Now, Dave was talking about post-exploitation tooling like Mimikatz. This is not the sort of tooling I'm kind of here to describe. What I'm talking about is tooling which aids you in doing security research and finding new and interesting security vulnerabilities. So yeah, for people who don't know who I am, I'm James. Um, I'm a researcher at Google's Project Zero team. Project Zero is a team inside Google who finds vulnerabilities in third-party products. And we consider things like Android to be third-party from our perspective, even though we are, of course, employed by the same people. Uh, now, unsurprisingly, I specialize in Windows. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be speaking at a Microsoft conference. Um, but I'm a big advocate for writing tooling, unsurprisingly. Now. I'm not someone who tends to find memory safety bugs, things like memory corruption or use after threes. If I do find a bug like that, it's usually by complete accident. I've been looking at some other uh, area of, of the code base and just happen upon a crash. I'm trying to, ex trying to do something, and all of a sudden, the Windows kernel blue screens. Well, I found a memory corruption vulnerability, but I wasn't looking for that. So I very much look for logical vulnerabilities where I'm exploiting the, the built-in design and implementation of, of a product. So if you're a security researcher, um, you've probably used uh, a tool like IDA Pro. And IDA Pro is a, is a disassembler. It can take a, a binary, such as a Windows binary, and convert it into um, assembly language. And then if you pay, enough, pay hex raise enough money, they'll even convert it to like a pseudo C, C++ for you. Um, and this is a tool I spend a disproportionate amount of my days in, looking for security vulnerabilities. Now, something which probably you're a bit more familiar with if you're not a security researcher is WinBack. And if you're potentially debugging some low-level uh, application, you might have to use this because it's sort of one of the most flexible debuggers on Windows itself. And Anyone want to willingly say they've never used Visual Studio in this audience? I don't think so. But of course, you can, from a security researcher perspective, well, I can write my exploits in, in Visual Studio. So these are all tools I use on a daily basis. But a sort of characteristic of these tools is the kind of general purpose. They're not, the closest you could consider something to be a security tool is probably IDA Pro. And even that is a Really, it's a tool for reverse engineering, which can or cannot have security implications. Like, you could just be reverse engineering a binary to understand how it behaves and how it functions, not to actually find security vulnerabilities. So what I am truly trying to advocate for is not tools like this. Like, I don't expect you to rewrite Visual Studio, although I'm sure if there's a Visual Studio developer here, they're writing Visual Studio on a daily basis. I'm advocating for tooling, which is domain specific, and specific to the domain of finding security vulnerabilities in specific areas of your platform of choice. Now, you may think, well, I'll be here all day if, if I have to implement anything of the level of complexity as, as like Windbag or Visual Studio. Well, of course, you don't have to do anything very complicated. Like tooling, 
can run the gamut of a couple of lines of Python to all the way up to thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. So if you're unsure where to start as a security researcher, well, start small, right? And a good place to start, I find, when I'm, when I'm trying to build up, say, a new capability, is take one of those existing general purpose tools and reuse their extensibility points. So Winbag, for example, has a JavaScript plugin. You can use JavaScript to write debugging scripts, which extract information, say, from the Windows kernel, or do application analysis, and use that to your advantage. And another good one is uh, IDA Pro, which has a Python extension. And so this is just built in if you install IDA Pro these days. And so say, for example, you're trying to reverse a Windows binary. Um, as anybody who ever has to develop on Windows knows, everything is a GUID, pretty much. So I want to get that GUID out somehow. Like, I need to get that so I can plug it into, say, maybe a script so I can find that GUID in, say, the registry or plug it into a search engine, maybe put it into chat GPT and get it to give me all the information about what that GUID means. I've not actually tried that. It might be something of interest. But of course, IDA Pro kind of tries to help you. It, it breaks apart that GUID data. But I can't just necessarily copy that straight into, uh, into Bing and get it to, uh, to tell me what that GUID is. So of course, it'd be really useful to have quick, something quick and dirty to extract that GUID into a form I can reuse. So you can write a pretty, pretty simple script. Um, Ida, the Ida Python extension has a fairly um, large API set. You can directly interact with the user. So for example, um, you can say, give me the effective address in the disassembled output of where the current cur user's cursor is. And so I can select that GUID and say, OK, read 16 bytes out of the database, and then just format it using the sort of standard UID class in Python, and just spit that out as a string. And now you've got something you can just trivially take and put somewhere else. Um, and as I say, this is, this is tooling which really isn't that, that hard to do. Like, it's really super simple. And once, you're, once you've got your foot in the door, like the, the hardest part of writing either Python is actually understanding the API set, assuming you know Python. Um, and once you have a base gra basic grasp, you can augment these tools and do, do some cool stuff. Um, now, a common sort of idiom from uh, a tooling perspective is like, oh, I write tools so I can work smarter, not harder. Well, yes, you can do. But my general view of tooling is something where you want to uh, work smarter, but also work harder because you can focus more of your hard work and more of your effort on finding that actual interesting output, not necessarily um, dealing with the minutia of, say, extracting data or finding particular information. So a really simple way of maximizing your, your, the, how, far, how much you can work is simple pattern matching, right? writing tools to take an existing pattern of some kind, say it's a bug class you're particularly looking in, say it's, oh, I want to find all DLLs which happen to import this particular function, which I know has an, an interesting uh, behavior associated with it, and write tooling for your very specific use case to find those patterns in uh, a code base or in a, in a platform. So a good example of this is something I've obviously done in the past is this is one of my first public bits of public research on Windows, um, maybe 10 years ago now, maybe, maybe more than that, finding uh, serialization issues in .NET. And it came out to the fact that if, if you remember 10 plus years ago, .NET was accessible from the browser. Like you could stick in your web page um, a reference to a .NET DLL or a XML browser application, and Internet Explorer and even uh, other browsers such as Firefox would just start up .NET uh, without any prompting whatsoever, with virtually no user interaction. 
But of course, that would be horrendously un unsafe if you just ran .NET code arbitrarily from the internet. So what the designers did would use the feature of .NET, the .NET framework called Code Access Security, to effectively sandbox this untrusted code from the internet. But I realized that one way of attacking these sandboxes is because once you've got arbitrary code execution, well, I can do some fun stuff. I can just play with classes and, and manipulate data. Was that serialization was a potential weak point in this, these sandboxes, and it could be used to escape those sandboxes. So what I needed was um, a list of serializable classes which I could look at. And beauty of .NET is it has reflections, so I can just go, give me an, give an assembly, get all the types from that assembly, and just tell me if they're serializable. That's easy, right? Like, literally, like, four lines of that code is just finding serializable types. Now, I then obviously worked further from that. So I realized, OK, it's not just serializable types which are potentially dangerous. It is the ability to have some sort of callback operating during the deserialization process, which is potentially of interest. So I then added some extra filtering for my types and just said, OK, does it implement iserializable interface? If it does, that's maybe interesting. Does it implement iObject reference? Yes, maybe that's interesting. And all this code did was spit out a big, giant list of classes which might be of interest. And then it was my hard work which then had to go and find these, these interesting serialization issues. Um, and that kind of comes down to the way in which I write tooling. So the tooling is an active part of my security research process. I don't just write some tools and hope I find some bugs, right? Like I write, write some basic tooling, maybe, have an initial seed of an idea, write some basic tooling, and use that to find my sort of initial list of targets. I could then use those initial list of targets to feed back into um, my tooling design. So after inspection, I go, OK, yes, those callbacks are potentially interesting. I can feed that information back and further develop my tooling and narrow down the kind of areas that I need to look at for, for my future research. So about uh, eight so years later, um, I'd done all this research in, in .NET serialization. I even was lucky enough to be a vendor for uh, uh, three or four weeks in, in Microsoft actually verifying that the fixes that the .NET Framework team had, had implemented were, were correct and managed to find a few ways of bypassing the mitigations that they've been putting in place. Um, and in the end, you can no longer run untrusted .NET from the browser because AIE has gone, but it's all pretty much blocked as well because um, it was probably never a great idea. Um, but I actually came back to .NET serialization. There was a, there was a big sort of upsurge in interest in general serialization issues, starting with things like Java, like actual sort of remo trivial remote code execution against um, services. And .NET was no exception. And I realized those previous ones required some sort of level of interaction. It required me to be running code in the context of that um, .NET application. But in this particular case, what I actually needed was something which just exploited, it, exploited the, uh, the application whenever it tried to deserialize an arbitrary stream with no way of running code beforehand in that context. So I, I came to the realization that, hey, like, what if a serializable class has a serializable delegate? So if you're not a, a .NET uh, developer, a delegate is a, uh, basically like a function pointer for .NET. And it turns out, probably from an unfortunate design decision in it, when it was initially implemented, delegates are serializable objects. And so, if it's serializable, then it can be deserialized, right? And so I just wrote, I augmented my tooling from 10 plus years ago with this new information and say, hey, any of those serializable types have a serializable delegate? Cool. And one of the things I got out of this is this class, uh, Comparison Comparer class, which is part of the base class library. And it is serializable, but it has a delegate inside it which is serializable. And it 
basically implements a, a comparer. And so by serializing this object with basically an arbitrary function pointer, an arbitrary delegate, uh, during the process of deserializing things like a dictionary where it has to compare keys and things like that, you could get it to um, create a new process on that server without any other further interaction. Just if that thing got deserialized, it will cause horrendous problems. And so I use this to exploit things like um, .NET's handling of DCOM uh, around WMI and things like that. Um, you can read my blog post about that. Um, and it's also, this has been then incorporated into things like the YSO Serial project, which is a project to contain um, gadgets for .NET serialization um, exploitation. Um, so. so those are sort of like my the basic automated stuff. But the, the kind of, I suppose the, the, the running theme of that is actually the output is not sort of analyzing the, the CIL of a .NET class. It is providing me with a mechanism to filter down a list of, of targets and, and use that to do more manual analysis. But it's actually, you can sort of take that even further. Like if you've got a very complicated platform, a very complicated application or system, sometimes I, I, I personally find it quite useful to just have something I can sort of play with. Like if you implement some sort of scripting language, you can just sort of, oh, what if I do this? Oh, that doesn't do, do anything interesting. What if I do this? What if I do this, right? And actually sort of like become a, a, become a human fuzzer in some ways of, of these sort of like systems. Um, and a really good example of this is my simple, this is a simplified diagram of com activation for out of process com objects. Now it turns out when I initially submitted this slide um, and uh, Blue Hat had a design team to, to, to make things look a bit more pretty. Um, I intentionally made this slide as absolutely horrendously ugly and complicated as possible. Uh, unfortunately, the design team came along and straightened out the lines, made it look, look a lot, lot more useful. So unfortunately, it is almost more comprehensible now than it was intended to be. But it is still a pretty, and as I say, this is simplified. There's a lot of things I'm missing out in this context. Um, and the thing, with, the thing we've come here is you've got interactions with uh, data stored in the registry, so com registration information, interface registration information. You have multiple different processes involved. You have the process which is instantiating this com object. You have the DCOM service which is responsible for accepting that, that event and going, oh, is there already a process necessary for me to create this com object? If not, I need to obviously create this new process for you. Um, that has then further uh, trails back to the registry, which does this access checking. Am I allowed to open this object? Am I allowed to do anything with this object? It's extremely complicated process. And it's also documented both quite well and quite poorly. There's loads of functionality in COM, which if you read the Microsoft documentation around it, uh, will not necessarily give you the full details. So one of the things I wanted to do was try and build up tooling which allowed me to do manual analysis of the COM attack surface to try and find interesting vulnerabilities. And so I wrote a tool called OLEView.net. You may have used the OLEView tool out of the SDK. I shamelessly stole the name and bit of the icon, um, but rewrote it all in .NET instead of written in C++ and augmented its functionality massively. So it can obviously enumerate all COM artifacts on a particular system. It can instantiate new COM objects. It can parse proxy instances to determine how you actually even call the interfaces on these COM objects. And provides it in either a, a pretty GUI, like obviously uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, of course, um, or through like a PowerShell scripting uh, interface. And so you can use this to do analysis, filtering, and just finding interesting, interesting COM objects to, to play with. So a good example of where my manual analysis sort of led me in this case was uh, exploiting COM session monikers. So if you're on, say, a terminal server, you will have multiple user sessions running at the same time. And you can get multiple user sessions, obviously, on a on a uh, standard client system, but most of the time there's not usually like multiple users logged on. But on a terminal server, you could be logged on as an unprivileged user with a domain admin on, on a different session. 
It turns out COM allows you to instantiate COM objects across the session boundaries, which is an interesting thing in itself. Now, of course, that would be like, oh, well, it's fine. Surely this is restricted to administrators only, right? No, <laughs> like non-admins can instantiate these COM objects. The only restriction was, is the security of our object, the activation security, does it permit me to do so? By default, most COM objects do not permit cross-session activation for non-administrators. But with my tooling, I was able to easily find objects which provided me with, oh, these, these theoretically could be instantiated cross-session, I could then actually inspect them using my tooling. I could extract what interfaces they support. Based on that information, I could either do reverse engineering of the DLLs, or I could actually just extract how those interfaces are called and use that information to try and find uh, a vulnerable class to exploit. And in the end, I found like a class which I could create cross-session from an unprivileged user, which pretty much just had shell execute hanging off an interface. And once I've got that, I can get code running on that other desktop um, and get privileges of, say, the domain admin on that machine. So, uh, of course, tooling is great for that sort of augmenting my ability to uh, um, find vulnerabilities. But I also use my tooling to aid my, obviously, failing memory over the years. Like, I do a lot of work. I look at a lot of different areas. Um, some of my tooling, you can kind of track the sort of things I'm interested in at the moment by tracking my GitHub commits on, on the, what, what things I've been submitting recently. So I try and make sure that if I add something to my tooling, I have enough information that, that then I can reuse that at a later date. And while I might obviously document it in a, in a document somewhere, if it's in a document, I might have to then rewrite some code which implements that. Whereas if it's in a tool I've already written, I don't have to do that. So this came up like literally the other week. Um, and I thought, for, for reasons which are, I'm not going to go into, I needed to know uh, what mount points, what repass points, which are basically symbolic links on NTFS, what repass points existed on a particular volume. And I'd written a function, query repass points, which used a um, poorly documented API to actually query for this list of repass points. Um, and so I would open, like, the, I'd try and open the volume and then call this function. And every time I'd get this invalid parameter, I thought, OK, maybe I need to open the device object. Nope, doesn't work. The root directory, nope, sorry. Subdirectories, nothing. It all kept failing with invalid parameter. And it's like, Scratching my head going, what, what am I doing wrong? Have, have Microsoft changed the behavior of this API? Well, it turns out if I went and read my comments on my, on my function, I actually left myself a note to say, hey, if you're ever going to use this function, you actually need to open this special magic, magic file path. right? And once that magic file path is opened, you can call, call this function, and it all just works. And lo and behold, it just worked. So. Obviously, documentation is useful as, co is, is useful as code in this, in this regard, rather than code being acting as documentation. So I use it to actually like remember how things work. And if you ever want to learn, like, oh, how does this particular API work, you might be able to find this in one of my tools, that I've used this API and actually give a, a reasonable implementation of it. And you can probably call it from like, .NET or, or C++. So I guess the, the, the final probably reason that I write tooling and why I like writing tooling is I like to share things. Like one of the, one of the things that Project Zero was built upon was sharing offensive security research. Security research, especially offensive security research, these days is very much uh, something which is, is held close to people's chests. It used to be that you just go on um, full disclosure mailing list, and there's probably like hundreds of bugs, cool zero days, cool, be, uh, cool um, exploitation primitives. These days, not so much. And the reason is, well, there's money to be made in, in those exploits, right? Like giving away your, your trade secrets, your, your, your specialist skills, your interesting exploitation primitives is, is no longer financially, uh, it's not good for your bottom line, right? 
Um, but Project Zero is different. We're trying to share information to the community to provide um, better outcomes. So as I've said, if you go on my GitHub page, you probably find uh, loads of uh, <laughs> a number of my projects, projects from my colleagues uh, for various different toolings. This one is specifically about my tooling, which allows me to interact with the native APIs of Windows. And I had that screenshot, which this is where that query repass points function is. And it has other things that I've, I've built up over my career, which are useful for my research, things like I can generate RPC clients on the fly to call over ALPC or name pipes. Um, it can, it has a full Kerberos stack and including the KDC if you, if you really need a fake KDC for some particular uh, operation. So there's loads and loads and loads of functionality in there. And yes, some of these things are probably implemented in other places like say the RPC calling, you could probably use Impacket for some of that stuff, right? But not for everything and not in a sort of Windows specific way. Um, and so these are just things that I built up over the years and aid as that documentation, aid in my manual analysis. And because it's then shared, people can reuse them. Um, Dave was talking about sort of file planting attacks. And one of my, probably my most successful uh, tools that I've released on GitHub was my symbolic link uh, testing tools. And these tools were all about testing out the implementation behavior of symbolic links and mount points on Windows. And a no, uh, quite a few people have told me like, oh yeah, I, I, ha I found this bug in um, a particular Microsoft service. And all I basically told Microsoft was, just download these tools from GitHub, run this command line, and you've got an exploit. And a lot of people managed to make a good, good living, relatively speaking, on bug bounties just based on using my tooling uh, for the purposes of, of doing that sort of exploitation. And that ultimately was the sort of driving force of making Microsoft change its stance on, on these sort of attacks and trying to do something about it, implementing mitigations, because they were basically getting deluged with all these reports about, hey, I can do this in this service, I can do this in this service. And it's like, if the barrier to entry is quite low, then people will, will make uh, use of that. Now, there is a dark side to sharing your tooling. Um, and bearing in mind, my tooling is not generally for post-exploitation purposes. So it's not in the sort of class of Mimikatz where if your, your AV engine and your EDR doesn't pick up Mimikatz, is it really an AV or an EDR, right? Like everyone sells, sells their, their products based on how much how often they can catch Mimikatz in the wild. Um, but my tooling is not like that. But because I don't stop, I have no way of stopping people how people use it, um, of course, antivirus goes, huh, this might have been used in a particular, particular way or by a particular actor, that clearly it must be malicious. Like, it's malicious by association, right? And of course, a lot of this is also our wonderful friend, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Like this is the definite dark side for me of, hey, if we just like avoid having to make any decisions ourselves, we'll just let the computers work out whether something's malicious. And then it becomes very, very difficult to walk that back. I've tried desperately to get my tooling unbanned from AV vendors, including Defender. And invariably they might why they might sort of allow list my specific uh, binary for five, six months, and then it comes back again because some machine learning tool has said, hey, no, 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 this is still malicious, and so it ends up blocking me again. Very frustrating, very frustrating. But hey, there we go. So, um, sort of wrapping up, like, obviously I am, I am talking from the perspective of a security researcher, and that might not necessarily apply if you're just a developer, but in charge of doing security work. But of course, these kind of ideas of tooling don't necessarily have to apply to just the research side of things. But if I have recommendations for if you want to, to be someone who's known for writing their tools, well, the first one is, of course, you don't have to write um, war and peace in one go, the war and peace equivalent of, of security tools. Just start small, iterate, like build up that tooling based on 
things you're doing with it, things you're using. Don't just write a tool because it, it sounds cool. Write a tool because you think it will be useful for your job or useful for your hobby, whatever you're doing. Now, I've also, I've seen a lot of uh, people's code over the years coming out of sort of the security community, and I would say that their coding style isn't necessarily conducive to, uh, to effective reuse or understanding. Um, I know sometimes if you're trying to create a quick hacky tool, you're not thinking like, so, like, do I need to build like a specific design document for this project, or like, where like everything has to have a unit test and verify that it's, it's the code coverage is 100% all the time? Like, okay, there's limits to how much you need to do, but following a good development practice means that in the end you can potentially pick this project back up at a later date and build upon it. Like my serialization stuff, it was simple enough but I was able to pick it up sort of seven, eight years later and go, oh, just I can just add some extra features to this tool because I can't, it was written well enough that it was easy to re-implement. And even though there are potential downsides from sharing, sharing your tooling, if you're able to share your results, I think it's, it's very valuable because people learn from that. People uh, understand better a particular security area, a particular platform area, if they have pre-existing tooling, and of course I know it kind of defeats the object of my talk that I'm saying you should write your own tools, but share it so other people don't have to write their own tools. Yes, I know there is a contradiction in there, but um, ultimately uh, I can't write every single tool in the world. And therefore I have to use other people's tools sometimes to do particular things. And the same is for other people. So if you can share your tools, you can generally multiply your outcomes. You can get more people to do analysis in your particular area of expertise and find more bugs and get maybe a large vendor to, to change their direction in security. Um, so those are just a few links of some of the stuff I've written. Um, now, I originally was going to do some demos, but of course, as you can see, I don't have a computer in front of me. It's kind of difficult to do the demos. Um, but I'll be around all day. If people actually want to see some of the tools I've written and see how I use them and see how they work, then just grab me. I think there's um, sort of a social aspect towards the end of the day where we'll just be sort of standing around and people can come and say, hey, uh, show me this tool or, or how do you find bugs like X? I'm always, always willing to talk to people. So thanks very much for listening to me. Um, I hope you have a good rest of the day. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone at, uh, at Microsoft for letting me come here.